In fifth place, we're starting with a lesser known artifact from the Warren's home. What appears to the innocent eye as nothing but a long black spike, perhaps left over from a construction project of sorts, holds a history of sadness and evil doing. Being the oldest item listed today, its history dates back to its use in the 1700s. While the name of the witch it belonged to has been lost to time, the spike was originally used in a black mass ritual, in an attempt to summon Satan himself to this world. The witch we're speaking of had attempted to curse the stake over the course of her pregnancy, hoping that it would become strong enough to take the soul of her womb in exchange for the devil. During the ritual, she plunged the stake into the flesh as sacrifice, but while it strengthened her relationship with Satan, it did not succeed in bringing him to earth. The stake was passed down as a fairly heirloom, bringing a feeling of longing and sadness to any that held it, until it was finally acquired by the Warrens. Moving along to fourth place, we're discussing the only item on this list that's made its way to Hollywood. Bathsheba's Jewelry Box. In January 1971, the Perron family moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island, where Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters began to notice strange occurrences almost immediately. It started with events that most of us probably wouldn't even register. Carolyn would notice that the broom went missing or seemed to move from place to place on its own. See, I'd personally be chalking that up to my ADHD. <laughs> Two young girls of the home began to notice spirits around the house. Carolyn then brought it upon herself to research the history of the home and discovered that it had been in the same family for eight generations, and that many of them had passed under mysterious or horrible circumstances. The most haunting spirit in the home is that of the witch, Bathsheba Sherman. Fairly well off, Bathsheba and her husband Judson had a son, Herbert L. Sherman, born with Bathsheba was approximately 37 years old. While the couple gave birth to three others, they were unable to survive past the age of seven. One of the passings of a neighbor's child in her care drew public attention during a post-mortem examination, when it was determined that the fatal wound was caused by a large sewing needle that had been impaled at the base of the skull. It's believed that Bathsheba took offense to Carolyn moving into what she considered her home and wanted to take back that control. The most notable incident being one afternoon when Carolyn said that she had been lying on the sofa and out of nowhere felt a piercing type of pain in her calf, and then the muscle began to spasm. Upon examination, she noticed a puddle of blood at the point of impact. She checked for bees or anything else that could have caused the puncture in her leg, but found nothing. In her daughter's book, Andrea Perron described the wound as perfectly circle, as if a large sewing needle had impaled her skin. Now, if I were to summarize the entire hell the Perron family endured for the decade that they lived in what they refer to as the Old Arnold Estate, we'd be here for an hour. But during one of the last instances where the Warrens were called in to help the ailing family, they removed the box from the home after thoroughly blessing it, believing that it was acting as a conduit for Bathsheba's demonic energy to affect the home. Moving on to our third place, we have The Conjuring Mirror. Unlike the last artifact on our list, this has nothing to do with the Hollywood franchise. Originally belonging to a 45-year-old New Jersey man named Oliver Birnbaum, it was used to practice a medieval ritual known as speculum, or mirror magic. He performed a lengthy incantation ritual known as a conjuring formula, inviting the spirit world to assist him in manipulating the future. In the beginning, Oliver saw very little in the mirror, other than the movement of blurred forms or quick little incidents that meant nothing to him. But the more he concentrated his attention into the mirror, the more control Oliver gained, and ergo, the more he could see. After performing this ritual obsessively for many months, he got to the point where all he had to do was state what he wanted to see, and the desired image would appear, eventually being able to tune into the future whenever he wanted. He gained the ability to project people he didn't like into the mirror, singling them out for punishment or revenge. The unknowing victim would be shown in a future situation, and Oliver would will misfortune to that person, being able to see his justice occur in the mirror just the way he planned it. And while this sounds like a fun projection of one's imagination, these malicious acts would actually be carried out by inhuman spirits. In order to make a victim fall down the stairs, a spirit would either momentarily disorient the person, apport some grease on a step, or go so far as to give the victim a psychokinetic push. Eventually, Oliver neglected the part of the ritual where he had to give homage to Satan, and as a result, the evil he proposed for others began to occur to him, along with the spirits that he turned loose on his enemies now infesting his own home instead. After about a week of torture, this man was so terrified that he called a prominent Catholic official and begged him to send a demonologist to his house. When the Warrens arrived at the address, they met a man frightened out of his wits, and rightfully so. Doors were opening and closing by themselves. Every minute, something would crash and break or bounce off a wall and smash. Ed was able to reverse the ritual originally enacted by Oliver, and blessed the house, stopping the disturbance. As the Warrens were about to depart, Oliver insisted that they take the mirror with them, and the five-foot-tall antique now lives in their museum. In second place, we have the black lace veil. Now, while I obviously love the idea of a cute gothy aesthetic, this is anything but. After one of their public lectures, Ed was conversing with a couple that had been in the audience, where the boy introduced himself as Alan and explained that he'd brought his girlfriend Lonnie to the lecture because he suspected that she'd been overtaken by some occult influence. He explained that when his girlfriend became angry, 
story, her features would change into something resembling a wolf, and then the voice of a different person would speak from inside of her. When Lorraine walked over to join the group, Lonnie experienced an episode of instantaneous possession and lurched out in an attempt to attack Lorraine. This incident terrified everyone in the vicinity, but Thorns ending the audience chat session immediately, before Ed escorted the couple to an offstage room while Lorraine stayed outside. In the backstage room, the girl was fully under possession, breathing heavily, and her facial features had transformed into the wolf-like appearance the boy had talked about. After about 10 minutes, the possession passed, and Lonnie was lucid enough to explain dealing with memory loss, along with losing hours and days of her life over the last three months, a symptom that is common in possession. She went on to share her background. She was a girl wealthy enough to buy whatever she wanted, but money can't always buy love. Originally, her now boyfriend Alan had refused all of her advances and bribery attempts at becoming hers, and she had resorted to visiting a store prominent in selling tools to help with witchcraft, purchasing there a book on the black arts, and later that night performing a ritual for acquiring lovers. This ritual involved, you guessed it, the black lace veil, on top of which she placed a crown of goat horns before renouncing God and her baptism, along with swearing allegiance to Satan, finishing the ritual by washing down the vow with a cup of animal life force. You know. Simple stuff. About a month after Lonnie performed the ritual, Alan began paying her the attention she craved, making her entitled world perfect. What she hadn't counted on, however, was that she was in debt to the demonic, having given them permission to enter her life. Ed knew immediately that Lonnie would have to undergo an exorcism as soon as possible and made contact with a priest the next morning, who was able to come and assist with the procedure. Upon arrival, the priest insisted on testing the spirit. He instructed Lonnie to close her eyes and slowly count to 20, while his assistant stood behind her and placed a cross six inches behind her head. The entity possessing the girl suddenly went wild, screaming, take it away, it burns, take it away. During the exorcism, it kept screaming, she's mine, she's mine, her soul is mine, in reference to Lonnie. It was eventually separated from Lonnie, but just before it departed, the thing vowed it would return to another. The Warrens brought the black lace veil, goat horns, cup, and the conjuring book home with them so she would be safe from repossession. But the tale of the veil doesn't end here. Ed received a phone call one day from a man named John Rand, who wanted him to meet his daughter Charlene, who he explained possessed a natural knowledge of what he took to be witchcraft. When she stared at people, even when they weren't aware of it, she'd fill their mind with inhuman terror. John called Ed specifically because Charlene was manifesting different personalities, some male, some female, and some that couldn't even be called human, but all making extremely threatening statements to John and his wife. Upon bringing Charlene to various doctors and clergymen, they recommended John be put in contact with Ed, and Ed agreed to have the girl and her father visit his home the next weekend. When Ed attempted to shake Charlene's hand upon meeting her, she backed away and stared distressfully at him, keeping track of every move he made. His attempts to question her resulted in no end answers, and her eyes began to wander about the room in boredom. When they landed on the black veil, Charlene jumped up, grabbed the veil, and clutched it to her chest. Her features immediately began to transform into those of a wild, sneering creature distinct from this otherwise attractive girl. Ed drew two vials of water to himself, one unblessed, the other blessed by an exorcist, and moved away from what was no longer Charlene, but an inhuman spirit, a lesser devil of hell. Horrid moaning and various animal sounds came from the girl as Ed blessed her, banishing the demon away for now a second time. These items have since been locked away in the museum. And finally, in first place, we have the Ouija board recovered from the Donovan household. 15-year-old Patty Donovan came across the Ouija board and decided to use it to find a friend. From the first yes in response to her queries, Patty was hooked. She spent months falling in love with a spirit she believed to be in love with her, telling it intimacies about her everyday life. After about a year of telling all of her secrets to the board, Patty had become emotionally dependent on the spirit, asking it one night to reveal her future. During the very long session, it laid out a scenario of Patty's life for the next six years, providing specific details, right down to the date of the birth of her first child and the fact that she would have a total of three children by 1978, all information that would eventually prove true. Being as dependent as she was, on the evening of March 2nd, Patty now pleaded for the spirit to manifest. The next morning, Theodore Donovan found the spark plug wires pulled out of his car, the rubber hoses unfastened, and the fan belt cut out when he was attempting to start his vehicle. Not much later, Patty attempted to start her car. It was discovered later that the internal engine had been completely disassembled. That week, other incidents of apparent vandalism occurred around the Donovan house. Foundation shrubs were yanked out of the ground, roots and all. On the roof, a six-foot cast iron pipe, which held electrical wires, was found bent at a 90 degree angle. On Friday, March 8th, Ted marked one flat on the kitchen calendar. No sooner did Patty get her car back from the shop than one of her other tires lost air. The next day, Saturday. Her father made the same entry on the calendar, although this time it seems the tire had been cut with a knife. In the meantime, Patty could no longer raise her invisible boyfriend on the Ouija board. Night after night, she tried to communicate, but the planchette would simply slide over to goodbye. She had no idea that her ethereal bow had actually manifested, in the form of a supernatural vandal, 
By the second week of March, material damage to the house and cars had become so troublesome that Ted had complained to the police. When they arrived, he pointed out the destruction done to the garden plants and shrubs, the exterior of the house, and the apparent intrusion into a locked garage to puncture the tires and tear engines apart. Before leaving, the policemen assured Ted that they'd keep an eye on the property during night patrols. Later that second week, after work, Ted and his wife Ellen were sitting in the kitchen with their son Brian when all three heard something smash against a wall somewhere inside the house. Cautiously moving to investigate, they found a gaping 18-inch hole in the plasterboard wall in Brian's room. Just as upsetting was the fact that the jagged edges of the plasterboard were pointing inwards, with the blow coming from inside the walls. Listening in the dark that night, Ted heard the sound of a board being pried loose, but after checking the entire house thoroughly, found no loose boards. The house was further plagued by loud noises every night that only escalated in frequency and volume along with further unexplainable damage to the walls. On April 1st, furniture began to levitate with a 250 pound dresser flinging its contents while flying erratically. Rocks had also begun to rain from the sky, pelting only the Donovan house, which the police bore witness to. Ted eventually broke down at work and explained the horror of his to his supervisor who urged him to reach out to the Warrens. Ted instead tried moving his family into a hotel at first and the spirits followed the family there, destroying the room and making so much noise that the family was thrown out of the hotel and forced to return home. Finally contacting Ed and Lorraine, they arrived in Maine as quickly as they were able to, finding the home in complete disarray. Lorraine said nothing, although at the time she sensed in the home the presence of entities so numerous and threatening that she had to fight with herself to keep from going back outside. After a lengthy tour of the house, Ed and Lorraine conducted an interview with the entire family where Patty's history with the Ouija board was revealed. The Warrens then contacted the Catholic Church to begin the process for an exorcism to be granted, which sadly took a month. The family experienced many more unexplainable horrors during that time. Oh, let me know in the comments if you'd like me to go through their entire story in another video. After the exorcism took place on May 2nd, the family was finally free of the demonic torment, but left with over $5,000 in damages to their home, which would be over $30,000 in today's money. Number five, the book of the sacred magic of Abermelon the Mage. The Book of Abermelon, or more formally, the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abermelon the Mage, is an old Jewish magic text that is thought to date back at some point in the 14th or 15th century. Now, it wasn't the initial publication of this book that gave it its notoriety. Instead, it was when it was 19th and 20th century magicians who were in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is a British secret society dedicated to the practice, research, and upholding of old occult called Magic Ways, but hush hush, you didn't hear that from me. One of the founders of the Golden Dawn, SLM Mathers, created the first ever English translation of the book in the 1890s, drawing from a previously established 17th century French translation. Now, Mathers' translation quickly became the definite magic text of the 19th century, eventually helping inspire Aleister Crowley to inspire his system of magic, the legendary occultist and fixture of one of the best Ozzy Osbourne songs ever. That solo still goes, man. Now, there's all kinds of spells and magic inside this text. Some real highlights include spells on how to conjure somebody and turn them into a donkey, how to summon a monkey to do your bidding, that sounds great, and how to bring forth spirits to fetch you goods. The big key point in this text, however, is an epic, multi-month spanning ritual that if performed correctly will allow the sorcerer to commune with their own guardian angel. The book theorizes that everyone has a guardian angel and that they are another part of their essence, a spiritual other half of yourself. The ritual involves, um, I, I don't know how to say this politely. You have to, uh, well, they say you have to get blissfully intimate with your other half. Once the honeymoon period is over, the caster then has to summon up and conquer unredeemed spirits of the infernal regions of hell to conquer them. And then they'll be able to master the spirit domain. That, that sounds like a lot of irredeemed spirits. I hope my angel might help out a little bit with that. This all sounds very complicated, so all things considered, maybe it's for the best that this one's locked away. Seems like heavy reading, not before bedtime. And if you're looking for more true tales of terror, fake frightening fribs, cursed relics, ancient evils, aliens, cryptids, conspiracies, ghouls, goblins, and pretty much everything spooky you can think of, Top 5 Scary is the place to be. Stay subscribed, but way more importantly, stay scary. Okay, let's keep going. Whole lot more video to get through. Number four, Book of Soiga. The Book of Soiga, also known by a more complicated name, the Alderia Siva Soiga Vokor, is an occult text that hails back from the 15th century. I'm pretty sure just saying that name out loud in front of the camera, I probably caused a curse on the office, so I'm sorry about that. This text would have been lost to time, just another forgotten cursed manuscript, if it weren't for the obsessive efforts of John Dee, a 16th century polymath who had his hands in just about every field of study. Polymath is a fancy, fancy word for a guy who studies just about everything, and Dee practiced 
chemistry, physics, astronomy, and also the occult. You know, there's always more to learn, right? Mr. D was particularly interested in contacting angels to learn the secrets of the universe. And this book contains a litany of recipes for magic spells and all sorts of writings on demonology and astrology. But most importantly, and what catched Mr. D's attention, is that the book is said to include the names and genealogies of all of heaven's angels. D believed that the book contained an ancient divine message written in a language spoken to by Adam, the true unspoiled word of God. And that's that's a pretty big statement. Now much like the Voynich manuscript, which I'll mention a little later in the video, so put a pin in that for now, it had 36 cryptic tables that remained undeciphered for centuries. D attempted at one point to crack the code with the help of a mystic who convinced D that he could channel the angels for him. D allegedly was so desperate to unlock the contents of this book that when his mystic told him it was part of the ritual that he be allowed a night with John D's wife, he agreed. That's the oldest trick in the book, man. The old, I'll let you talk to angels if I can go out with your wife gamble. Ugh, can't believe you fell for it. Dee's wife would end up birthing a son, Theodore Dee, the fatherhood of which was um, disputed, to say the least. John Dee was never able to crack the code in his lifetime and decipher the Book of Soiga, and perhaps for the best, as it was said he was warned that man was never meant to uncover those secrets, and that knowledge would end his life. The book is now said to reside in the British Library, although digital copies are available. Read it at your own risk, and if somebody says they can translate it for you, just make sure you really read everything on the fine print in the contract before you sign that, okay? Just looking out for you. Number three. The Grand Grimoire. That is so fun to say. This next entry has been nicknamed the Gospel of Satan. So if you're looking for an indication as to whether or not this book is, you know, evil, there you go. They had to put that on a sticker, put it on the cover right next to the Oprah's Book Club recommendation. This book is said to have originally been written by a man possessed by the devil sometime in the 16th century. It's an infamous occult text and is said to contain dark incantations, spells and rituals, tools on how to force demons to do one's bidding, and even some instructions for a little necromancy 101 for fledgling dead raisers. It's not all brimstone and hellfire though. There are also reports on how to make pacts with spirits for personal gain, rituals to win the lottery, talk to ghosts, make yourself invisible, and even adorably, how to win love. Never heard of a demon working to help someone fall in love. Now all that sounds cool, definitely. I know I would love to have like a little skeleton minion who could help me with chores, maybe be like my little buddy. I love playing a necromancer in Skyrim, but these things don't really work out if you don't know what you're doing. Take a look at Full Metal Alchemist, you know, that didn't work, they didn't know what they were doing. Even opening this book is considered equivalent to selling your soul to the devil. As Soon as you crack the spine, it's like signing the contract. Because of the book's nefarious reputation, the original copy of the manuscript has been sealed away inside the Vatican's secret archives, and not currently available to the public. So I don't think whatever they're listing on Amazon as the Grand Grimoire for $10 is the real Grand Grimoire. Number two, the Voynich Manuscript. Script. The Voynich Manuscript has got to be one of my favorite stories of a mysterious manuscript, like, ever. I guess that's why I put it at number two. Unlike a lot of entries on this list, it's actually very easy to come across a digital copy of the Voynich Manuscript. It's available to read online. The only trouble is reading it honestly probably won't do you a lick of good since it's written in a language no one has ever heard of and there's no record of it ever having existed. Yale University has the entire thing up and available online if you're feeling confident enough that you can take a crack at it and feel like banging your head against a brick wall for a few hours. The book is a handwritten, hand-illustrated codex of 240 pages of pure mystery, featuring gorgeous illustrations and typography, and what the book is about is your guess is as good as mine, honestly. Carbon dating suggests that it stems from the 15th century, and analysis of the style of the text and illustrations within suggests that it could have been penned during the Italian Renaissance. But just about every single aspect of this thing is shrouded in mystery. We don't even know what it's truthfully called. The Voynich Manuscript is the name it was given after the initial owner, Wilfred Voynich, purchased it in 1912 and brought it to public attention for the first time. Sorry, not the first owner, I'm sure several other people owned it before him. As such, the language inside the book is occasionally referred to as Voynich. Keys. Now some pages are missing, lost to time completely, and the pages we do have are just a puzzle. Some are foldable sheets of various sizes, some pages have wondrously drawn diagrams or illustrations showing things like plants, some fictional, some real, and astrological symbols, drawings of people. Over the years there have been several efforts to try and decode and document the book and figure out just what it is. 
A prevailing theory, admittedly a boring one, is that it's a guide to botany written in a mysterious script, a forgotten language, an uncrackable code, an incredibly convoluted hoax. Of course, with any good mystery, there are some wild theories. Some say the Voynich manuscript could be written from an extraterrestrial gifted to humanity, or written in demonic script perhaps, or that biblical language that we were mentioning in the book Soygas a few points ago. Like I said, it's available online, so I leave this up to you. If you manage to crack it, let us know down below in the comments. Comments. We're all clamoring for it. And number one, the Codex Gigas. When it comes to cursed and demonic books, the Codex Gigas is one of the biggest ones around. Like, literally. Codex Gigas translates to giant book, which isn't exactly a scary name. When you see the size of this behemoth, it starts to make a little bit more sense. This thing is massive, two feet long. Now, giant oversized illuminated manuscripts were pretty common around the area the book was penned, but this one stood out for its immense size and the dark rumors surrounding the supposedly cursed text. Don't even try reading this thing, just lifting it will give you a hernia. That's the curse. It's occasionally been dubbed Satan's Bible due to the legend surrounding its origin. It's a good story, so get cozy. Supposedly, the legend goes that a monk by the name of Herman the Recluse, which is also what they used to call me, was condemned to death for heresy and was to be walled up alive and starved. In a desperate plea to save himself, Herman tried to convince the prior and the abbot as a whole that if he could pen a manuscript to honor God's glory and that it would contain all of human knowledge and all of human history in one book and if he could pen it in one night, he would be let free. The abbot agreed, thinking this was, of course, impossible. Herman wrote until midnight, wearing his fingertips down, and in a moment of desperation, made a prayer to Lucifer and asked for his eternal soul in exchange for the book's completion in order to repent for his sins. I totally get it. You know, I gotta be honest. I have done some pretty nutso stuff trying to make sure my scripts get in time for deadline. Haven't quite sold my soul to the devil yet. I usually just rail Red Bulls, but I'd probably make a similar deal under a similar deadline. Now, I don't want to poke any holes in Herman's logic here, but I will say maybe selling your soul to the devil is part of the reason you got into this mess in the first place because that does sound a little bit like heresy, but it's not my place to judge. I'm not an archdeacon. A variation of the legend states that Herman worked for years on the manuscript, day and night, but still was unable to complete it in his lifetime and ask for the devil's assistance. Anyway, no matter the story, the legend states that Satan signed the Bible with a particularly terrifying illustration of himself. I mean, take a look at it. It's horrifying looking. The book contains a birth of information. Like they said, it was supposed to be everything humanity had attained up to that point in one big, 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 big book. These days, the Codex Gigas is preserved in the Natural Museum in Sweden, where you can admire the penmanship of Herman the Recluse and his ghost author, Satan. In fifth place, their origins in the profession. Honestly, before today, I never really dug too much into the personal lives of Ed and Lorraine Warren, preferring to focus my interest on their professional work and only really knowing about their daughter, Judy, from the rare time they mentioned her in one of their books. And her husband, because of all the rare footage he's publicized since Ed and Lorraine's death. Outside of the Hollywood romanticizing, which I promise I'll touch on eventually, how did Ed and Lorraine actually fall into this line of work? So Lorraine was nine when she first saw auras. She thought everyone saw them, but found out quickly otherwise when she brought it up at her Catholic school when she compared the lights surrounding the Mother Superior and Sister Joseph and was told immediately to never talk of what she saw ever again, learning to, you know, hide her gifts or joke it off. Ed, on the other hand, grew up in a haunted house. He'd look into closets and see faces, one specifically of an old lady. The temperature in his room would drop and he would hear footsteps and heavy breathing. When he brought it up to his father, he was told that, you know, there's a logical explanation for everything and just leave it at that. So they both did their very best to try and ignore their gifts, wanting to live normal lives, but with an oil tanker in the North Atlantic. A fire erupted and all of the men on the ship had to jump overboard. As Ed was in the icy water, he prayed for help and was soon rescued, believing it to be from cosmic interference. So after that, cosmic interference. So after that, affair to sell their wares, and eventually this became helpful during the beginnings of their work. They would research houses they believed to be haunted, and then, you know, go to that house. After Ed would paint the domicile, he would hand the painting to Lorraine, who would knock on the door and offer the homeowners the painting as, you know, their ticket into the house. Once she struck up a conversation with the homeowner, they would learn more about the property and hauntings, if there were hauntings, that is. At one house, which already had, you know, some local notoriety as a supernatural hotspot, Lorraine went into spontaneous trance and claimed that this is where she learned not to fear death. 
Hmm, I thought there was more to that. In fourth place, we have the White Lady hoax. Just so we all have the same context going into this, the White Lady is the name of the ghost that haunts the Union Cemetery in Easton, Connecticut. So most locals believe her to be the ghost of Harriet Seeley, whose young son passed shortly after being born, with Harriet herself passing soon after. Legend believes she may have died in hopes of finding her son, and still wanders their final resting place searching him out. Other folks believe the White Lady is the ghost of a woman from the 1940s who killed her husband and later herself and is, you know, doomed to wander the graveyard. Her physical description is the one thing that remains consistent. She is a young woman wearing a white dress with dark hair. So me if I was wearing white, which will never happen here. I promise you that. It seems as if she enjoys scaring the daylights out of the living, which, you know, once again, my kind of gal. Many who have witnessed her believe that they have almost hit her with their vehicle, only to find no trace of her once they pull over. Others claim they have often seen her hovering slightly above the ground around the cemetery, going back and forth amongst different gravestones. Now, Ed Warren was obsessed with her and has gone on record as being, you know, determined to capture footage of her on film. Once he was able to do so, he uh, kept the tape for himself. Yeah, he hoarded that tape like it held the secrets to the universe, or you know, like he was the the US government with all the proof they have of alien life. He allowed a select few people to view it while, you know, it was being held in his personal archives, and none were ever allowed to further analyze it on their own time. I'm raising an eyebrow right now in suspicion. And once again, if I uh, had a red flag, I'd be waving it right here. So since the passing of both Ed and Lorraine, their son-in-law, Tony Spera, has released the footage in its entirety to YouTube. The tape shows an apparent white human figure moving behind some tombstones. Similar to videos of UFOs, you know, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, the figure is at that perfect distance and resolution so a shape can be seen, but we don't have any details that could lead to a definitive identification. A woman named Judith Penny, who I will discuss in more detail later, has said she helped Ed maintain his reputation as a ghost hunter. So what does that mean? So when he claimed to have captured the um, white lady on tape in the summer of 1990, after camping out in the graveyard for a week, allegedly, Judith was the mystical being spotted on tape, masking herself with a white sheet. In third place, we have Catholicism as an undercurrent. This is probably the only thing that has always bugged me, and while it might be less of like a secret in the gotcha sense, allow me to explain. Hauntings Ed and Lorraine spoke about were caused by people who refused to conform to traditional family values. Only people who submitted to the patriarchy and the church could be safe in their eyes. Their 1980 book, The Demonologist, kind of explains it all. That Ouija boards would get you haunted, but so would reading books about witchcraft, owning an image of a non-Christian deity, or attending conscious raising groups. The horror in Amityville was supposedly aggravated when the unlucky homeowners engaged in the unholy pagan practice of, uh, oh yeah, meditation. Addiction, depression, and disobedient children were all satanic. Hate, rage, despair, misery, drunkenness, and a sense of worthlessness will attract the demonic in a snap, according to Ed. One story in The Demonologist centers on a young woman who succumbed to evil after being fornicated with against her will. I do own this book, and I remember that not sitting super well with me. It was essential not just to stick with the status quo, but to be satisfied, with Ed going on record as saying, you know, that a happy home is one's best defense, and even the most powerful exorcism will be effective only if you keep up an emotional atmosphere that does not attract such entities. And while I do believe this to an extent, not so far as Ed does. That atmosphere would involve going to church, by the way, saying that once a week was a good start. Yeah, I, I don't go to church. When you really think about it, the Warren's entire basis of work kind of relied on victim blaming, evil that could you know, only happen to people who were already evil themselves. So personally, I don't agree with this whatsoever. Bad things do happen to good people, and not just because they don't follow Catholicism doesn't make someone evil. If you don't see what I'm seeing, allow another quote from Ed to help clarify things. <clears throat> people who do negative or patently unnatural things are essentially doing the devil's work for him and actually attract negative spirits to their side. Ed Warren was the homophobic brand of Catholic. Yes, I'm fully aware that not all Catholics observe this, and while most do not, Ed fell under that specific strain that sadly does. As a queer gal who didn't fully strain that sadly does. As a queer gal who didn't fully learn this until today, it kind of broke my heart that people who were so open to helping others and the unknown could be so close-minded. In second place, we have fraudulent items in the museum. So Ed and Lorraine were investigating numerous cases from the 1950s until they passed, right? And they founded like a whole society devoted to the research and investigation of the paranormal in 1952. You know, not to forget their entire museum attached to their home dedicated to objects from their cases. So explain to me how their website only has 
10 public case files, and why so much from the museum looks like leftovers from a spirit Halloween. Doesn't anyone else find it pretty suspicious that we only get details from the really big news cases, while well, artifacts from other, like, lesser cases are barely a footnote and have no story or witnesses attached? So in one corner of the Warren's Occult Museum is the skin of a tiger that is said to have killed 33 people in India while possessed by a demonic spirit. But yet, when I try to research this were tiger, I find no account of any reportings in history about such a case, outside of, you know, their quotes, or any offers from Ed and Lorraine to go into detail about any events leading to how it came into their possession. Seriously, take a look at some of this stuff. Given what I know about modern day Satanism, that idol looks like a paper mache alien mock up. Well, most folks who practice Satanism don't actually pray to any sort of idol or to the devil himself. But sure, for a moment I'll pretend like that's real and move on to the um, black magic skull, which just looks like a cheap haunted house prop for a glow in the dark room. Ditto for the um, chilling masks. You know what, actually that's a lie. I've seen cosplayers make better masks. I'm not going to even try to rationalize the skull with horns or the recreation of the Witch of Monroe. Y'all don't need to see me fuming right now. In first place, their personal life. So if you watch the film franchise, you'd think Ed and Lorraine had a pretty ideal, wholesome, perfect Americana family style life. But the reality isn't so shiny or pure, despite what, you know, they preach all the time. In the early 1960s, Ed Warren initiated a relationship with an underage woman with Lorraine's knowledge. Ed was in his mid-30s when he met Judith, who was exactly half his age. Yucky. Having not yet gained enough fame as a self-trained demonologist to pay the bills, Ed was working as a city bus driver in Monroe, Connecticut, while Judith was a student at Central High School in the nearby town of Bridgeport, who, you know, conveniently rode his bus route. The two began an amorous relationship, according to a legal declaration from Judith in November of 2014. Heck, by 1960, in 1963, she had moved into the Warrens' home, and for the next 40 years, she had a sexual relationship with Ed with Lorraine's knowledge. That same year, Judith was arrested after someone reported her relationship with Ed to local police, because, you know, busybodies everywhere. And she spent a night in the North End prison in Bridgeport while police tried to persuade her to sign a statement admitting to the affair. After she refused to cooperate, she was ordered by the court to report to a delinquent youth office for the next month. So, you know, Ed, being the great guy he was, picked her up from school every week and drove her to the mandated meetings. Judith claimed that Ed told her many times that she was the love of his life. The Warrens explained her presence in the home as a, you know, a niece or a poor girl who they had taken in out of charity and who helped them with office tasks. And she was mentioned in a lot of their books as being, you know, like their secretary, uh, most notably in The Demonologist, which I've already quoted a couple times today. What do you know? I own a copy. In May of 1978, well in her 30s, Judith became pregnant with Ed's child, and Lorraine persuaded her to have an abortion because the birth of a child could become public and any scandal could ruin the Warrens' business. Now, if that wasn't awful enough, Judith has also claimed that Ed was, on occasion, physically offensive to Lorraine. Judith described one night in particular where she saw Ed slap Lorraine so hard she lost consciousness. Early on, she said, she witnessed him backhand his wife. Well, it might be easy to dismiss all these claims as, you know, hooey or someone trying to make something out of nothing, there is an interesting element from Lorraine that kind of proves this to be true. So when Lorraine signed on to consult on The Conjuring movies, she got a contract that states that the movies will not feature negative information about the Warrens, mentioning specifically intercourse with minors, youngling bad videos, youngling uh, bad videos, anything to do with woman of the night, or sexual violence. Kind of weird to have to spell that out if you don't have anything to worry about. Now, this is where I was wondering, well, where was the daughter in all this? Judy is still very much alive. What did, you know, what does she have to say about it? She spent most of her years living with her grandma and not her parents, claiming that it was because her parents were always traveling, so it was the easier and safer option. Her parents told her that they took Judith Penny in so she could have a place to stay and watch their house. But their daughter could have helped watch the house if she lived with them. Just saying. In fifth place, we have a cursed wallet. So this tale begins in October of 1972, when an officer at the United States Military Academy contacted the Warrens a day before they were scheduled to present a lecture to the cadets there informing them that a curious security problem had arisen and uh, could they possibly help? Now obviously they said yes or else we wouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> so the next day at a little past four in the afternoon, they entered the gates of the academy and were escorted to the office of Major Donald Wilson. So the Major went on to explain how an unaccountable breach of security was occurring in the home of West Point's commanding general. Ed asked the Major if he knew the nature of the problem, to which the man replied that there was a ghost in the general's quarters. So the Warrens were soon escorted to meet the general and his wife, where they were directed into a sitting room, where the general explained that that, uh, well, nothing macabre had happened. A number of curious incidents had occurred without any kind of explanation. So, some background. In the basement of that building, there is a private study that at the time was kept locked and secure. But no matter how many times the bunk in there was made up, it was always found ripped apart later. 
Upstairs, ghosts had been seen flitting about the house. Oh, and personal belongings and other important articles were regularly found missing. The man emphasized not stolen, but just missing temporarily. Later, all the stolen items would be found upstairs, neatly laid out on the dresser in the general's bedroom. So he asked Ed if this could be, you know, caused by a ghost, and Ed confirmed that it was indeed a possibility, and probably like a human ghosty, and not a demonic spirit. Lorraine offered to walk throughout the home to try and, you know, establish where the spirit might be present, while Ed and Major Wilson headed for the basement with the key to the downstairs study. As usual, the bunk was torn apart, as though someone had been sleeping in it. Well, nothing else was disturbed. So while Lorraine did her walk through the house, she picked up impressions of the powerful individuals who had spent time in the home in many, many years over the years, but hardly any sense of a mischievous spirit. She offered to enter a trance state later that evening, after the presentation, to attempt to contact the spirit. And the group, you know, was like, all right, you do you, let's try this. So much later that night, after the events of the day, the group made its way upstairs to the MacArthur bedroom. All lights were turned off but one, and Lorraine closed her eyes. She described seeing a black man wearing a dark uniform with no markings, who was overtaken with a sense of fear, guilt, and lack of acceptance. He told her that he'd been accused of killing, and his cell was in the basement, but the army had exonerated him of that crime. He was very sorry, and could not hold his sorrow any longer. He told her that his name was Greer, and you know, spelt it out clearly for Lorraine, and she was able to convince him to pass over into the light. So after she exited her trance, Lorraine gave a complete description of the man and said at the end that he had simply vanished, and mentioned that he had left his wallet in that downstairs bunker. So the general is adamant that based on the uniform Lorraine had described, no black men had served at West Point during that time. But you know, he mentioned he would look into it and thank the Warrens for their time. You know, goodbye, alright. Sure. A few weeks later though, Ed and Lorraine received a phone call from the general. It was discovered that a black man, a porter by the name of, yep, Greer, had served there. So he had been assigned to the Thayer Mansion in the early 19th century, and he'd been accused of committing death, but the army did exonerate him of it. His records had been out of order, and he would now be officially filed as deceased. Also, the walls in the bunker had been renovated, and the wallet was finally found. What do you know? The army offered to mail it to the Warrens just to be safe, and it has stayed in their museum ever since. In fourth place, we have the Snedeker family rosary beads. And as you might expect, this true story begins in the witching hour, in the wee small hours of the morning. You know, because if rosary beads aren't scary enough. One night, very late at night, Ed and Lorraine were contacted by this family who had just moved into a house on Meriden Avenue in Southington. Specifically, the mother of the family unit and a niece who came to stay with the family were on the phone. And, uh... So originally what they found and you know bought was a big and seemingly welcoming home. But what they didn't know when they bought it was that it was a um, former funeral home. Oh, and um, fun fact, the morticians at the funeral home were allegedly involved in necrophilia or you know, performing um, sex acts with corpses. And um, oh, what used to be the showroom for the coffins was now um, where the younglings were. And just down the hall from that was the place where the bodies were prepared for viewing. Yeah, not grim at all. So the boys were the first to start talking about things they had seen and experienced, saying they were absolutely terrified, and the parents, you know, like chastised them at first for it, but the boys were so scared they started sleeping on the floor in the living room. Among the sounds they would hear were the sound of chains pulling the coffins upstairs, and um, just, you know, there were no more coffins in the house. So the women who called the Warrens were terrified. With the niece in a small bedroom in the back of the house and the covers on her bed were levitating around her like there was like a fan blowing them around. Lorraine said while the mother was on the phone with her, even more bizarre events started happening. So remember those rosary beads? Yeah, she had them in her hand and while she was speaking, the beads were actually being pulled apart and falling to the floor. Lorraine and Ed went over the next morning with the family's parish priest. And a blessing the house seemed to do absolutely nothing to calm things down. And that's when the Warrens decided to call uh, the bishop's office. So the church eventually sent an exorcist, which seemed to like sort of do the trick, but not before one last hurrah from whatever the heck was believed to be haunting the house, because you know, demons don't like to give up without a fight. There was this huge tree in front of the house, and half the tree, with no wind, broke off and fell on the property. The family uh, moved the heck out of Dodge a short time later, and Ed and Lorraine kept the rosary beads that had been pulled apart, because um, if a demonic spirit can touch a Catholic relic, that means it's been infested with something absolutely awful, and they didn't want to risk the beads spreading throughout the world and causing even more damage. Yeah, that makes sense. In third place, we have a long black spike. So what appears to the innocent eye is like nothing but like a fence stake, perhaps left over from a construction project of sorts, actually holds a history of sadness and evil doing. Being the oldest item listed today, its history dates back to its use in like the 1700s. While the name of the witch it belonged to has been lost to time, the spike was originally used in a black mass ritual in an attempt to summon Satan himself to this world. 
The witch we're speaking of had attempted to curse the stake over the course of her pregnancy, hoping that it would become strong enough to take the soul of her um, womb in exchange for the devil. During the ritual, she plunged the stake into the flesh as sacrifice, but uh, while it strengthened her relationship with Satan, it did not succeed in bringing him to earth. The stake was passed down as a family heirloom, bringing a feeling of longing and sadness to any that held it until it was uh, finally acquired by the Warrens. Knowing that the museum is technically closed, I worry if any vandals break in, the damage they could do with something that looks so unassuming, but it's so dangerous. In second place, we have the Carlson's Knickknacks. So, this happily married couple in their 30s bought this old inn in New England. No big. So, Nathan Carlson traveled a lot during the week, but his wife, Alexandra, was home all the time to take care of their two daughters. Not long after moving in, Mrs. Carlson and her daughter began hearing footsteps on the second floor where, you know, in the past, lodgers used to stay. During the afternoon and late into the night, they'd hear dragging, heavy booted footsteps move across the floor above them. Mrs. Carlson's older sister, who lived nearby, occasionally stayed overnight in the house and also heard these footsteps. The Carlsons had rooms set aside elsewhere in the house for, you know, like live and farm help, and these men would hear the footsteps walking in circles around their bed. Sometimes, while Mrs. Carlson would be asleep at night, she'd be awakened by the spirits in the home, which would actually yank the covers off the bed while she was, you know, in it. She later found out that very same thing happened to the farm help, which uh, explained why the men tended to you know, quit so soon after they were hired. Eventually, the infestation phenomena upgraded into whisperings that could be heard behind closed doors. However, when Mrs. Carlson or her older sister checked the room where the whisperings were coming from, there was never anyone present. Although these spirits projected words that were often audible enough to be heard, the woman could never quite identify the language that was being used. And as time went on, the uh, harassment continued. After the missus would straighten up the house, knickknacks and other little items would never be quite where she left them. Outside the house at night, lights would be seen in the attic, although there was no electricity up there. While painting a room one day, the heat was suddenly drawn away, and Mrs. Carlson felt a hand touch her shoulder. She said she became so angry that she threw the paintbrush in the direction where she believed the entity to be, and told it out loud, I don't know who you are or what you want, but you're not gonna get me. Oh yeah, real smart. So this phenomenon went on almost daily, since this infestation had occurred in the house a long, long time ago. Exact date unknown. Both the kitchen and the bathroom water faucets would suddenly turn themselves on, full force at the same time. And on occasion, Mrs. Carlson would hear three knocks at the front door, which, um, that's a sign of an inhuman presence. But whenever she'd go to the door, there would be nobody there. On the second floor, a visitor reported seeing a snake on the window ledge after hearing three taps on the window, yet there was no nearby tree the reptile could have climbed. Yeah, say, snakes, nope. Oh, it gets worse. Ah, well, living in the house, the Carlsons had another spawn. And one night, while the missus was watching television in the living room, she suddenly heard a tremendous, powerful explosion. When she jumped up to check, thinking out know, the furnace had kaboomed, she found the door to the infant's room violently torn open. Objects were still swinging and vibrating, and the temperature in the nursery was equal to a meat logger. Although the spirits in the home had evidently tried to kill uh, the youngling, the little one managed to live through the experience. Thank goodness. However, when the spawn reached three years of age, Mrs. Carlson was walking past him as he played with some knickknacks in the living room, when he suddenly let go with a loud shriek saying, You stepped on Beatrice! So Mrs. Carlson put down the laundry she'd been carrying and asked, Who? To which he responded that Beatrice was his friend who told him what to do. Mrs. Carlson then told her son to ask Beatrice who she was, and after a pause, he replied that Beatrice had told him to tell her that um, she's a witch. So the mom took away the items the boy was playing with and almost sent him into hysterics in the process. She tossed him into a basket in her bedroom closet, you know, somewhere the boy was forbidden to go without her permission, and didn't really think about it until later that night when she was in bed by herself and saw a large black form in the room with her. She described the entity as being, you know, blacker than the blackest night, moving slowly around the room, freezing her with fright. I swear I'm not a poet. <laughs> Before the black mask went away, it transmuted into a globe of synthetic light about the size of a basketball, while producing a deafening roar, which she compared to a blasted furnace. This went on for many nights until the warrants were called in, and like many other times I've mentioned today, took a tour of the home, blessed it, and realized uh, the knickknacks were directly tied to the entity. Now, they've never described them in detail, so I don't have any clear photos to discuss today, but I'm assuming they're around the size of action figures if a three-year-old was able to play with them. In first place, we have Bathsheba's jewelry box. So this is probably the most famous case on today's list. In January of 1971, the Perron family moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island, where Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters began to notice strange occurrences almost immediately. So this started with events that most of us probably wouldn't even register. Carolyn would notice that the broom went missing or seemed to move from place to place on its own and the young girls of the home began to notice spirits around the house. Carolyn then brought it upon herself to research the history of the home and discovered that it had been in the same family for eight generations and that many of them had passed under mysterious or horrible circumstances. The most haunting spirit of the home is that of which Bathsheba Sherman. Being fairly well off, Bathsheba and her husband Judson had a son, 
Herbert. Born with Bathsheba was about 37 years old, and while the couple gave birth to three others, they were unable to survive past the age of seven. One of the passings of a neighbor's ward in her care drew public attention during a post-mortem examination, when it was determined that the fatal wound was caused by a large sewing needle that had been impaled at the base of the skull. It's believed Bathsheba took offense to Carolyn moving into what she considered her home and uh, wanted to take back that control. So the most notable incident overall was one afternoon when Carolyn said that she had been lying on the sofa and out of nowhere felt a piercing type of pain in her calf and then the muscle began to spasm. And upon examination, she noticed a puddle of uh, redness at the point of impact. She checked her bees or anything else that could have like caused the puncture in her leg but found nothing. In her daughter's book, Andrea Perron describes the wound as perfectly circular, as if uh, a large sewing needle had impaled her skin. Now if I were to summarize the entire hell the Perron family endured for the decade they lived in what they refer to as the Old Arnold Estate, we'd be here for an hour. But during one of the last instances, the Warrens were called in to help the ailing family and uh, they removed a box from the home after thoroughly blessing it, believing that it was acting as a conduit for Bathsheba's demonic energy to affect the home, this being the jewelry box. Number 5. Annabelle Well, it just would not be the Warrens without Annabelle. She's easily the most famous thing in their collection and let's be real, she's probably one of the most famous dolls on the planet, you know, Barbie Annabelle. Do you ever wonder if they ever thank her for all the good publicity she's given them? By now, I'm sure if you're watching this video, you know the story of Annabelle, the haunted doll that they kept captive, but I'll run it by you again in case you don't. It was given to a nursing student as a gift from her mother, and within days, things started getting scary. Notes would appear around the house scrawled in red liquid that read out terrifying messages like, Help me. Allegedly lunged at the girl's boyfriend one night and well after a doll comes alive and lunges at you, you call some help and then Ed and Lorraine were called in to exercise the demon inside Annabelle. In the end, they keep her locked up very tight surrounded by rosaries and holy water to ensure the demon inside can't harm anyone anymore and they keep her locked up except when they wheel her out for publicity events and take her to conventions. While Annabelle has enjoyed quite the career as a movie star, the real Annabelle is locked away to keep the evil dormant. In this footage, we're treated to some up close and personal glamour shots of Annabelle in the flesh or, or, or stuffing I guess, locked tight in her cage. The footage comes from Tony Spera, the son-in-law of Ed and Lorraine Warren who's going to get mentioned a whole heck of a lot in this video. He takes us on a brief tour of the museum, getting a real up close to it. Even through a YouTube screen, you can feel some evil radiating off this doll. Now sadly, if you're a big Warren super fan and you want to go check out the museum, unfortunately it's closed right now, but they are hoping to reopen it, so one day Annabelle can get back to scaring her fans in person like she always has. Uh, when I said before that they take her out to conventions, that wasn't just me being snarky, it's real. She just recently was at the Warren's Paracon, the convention dedicated to supernatural hunters of the paranormal. You can line up, take a photo with Annabelle. I'm not sure if I'd take a selfie with her though. I don't know. It might look good on a Tinder profile, maybe? I'm not sure. And if you're looking for way more Ed and Lorraine content, true tales of terror, fake fibs of frauds, cryptids, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, aliens, pretty much anything scary under the sun and above it, well you already know Top 5 Scary is the place for that. Make sure you stay subscribed, please ring that little bell to the side so you get all of our videos when they upload. But do that at the end of this video, okay? Because I got four more pieces of Ed and Lorraine footage coming up for you right now, baby. Number four, the museum tour. Now, if you wanted to go to the world's foremost collection of haunted relics and cursed objects, there's probably no storeroom full of curses more than the legendary collection of the Warren's Haunted Museum of Souvenirs. Now, like I said just a second ago, the museum is currently closed as of the writing of this video, but they are trying to reopen soon. You know, cross your fingers. But in the meantime, you can take a digital tour, as this footage posted by the Warren's son-in-law, Tony Spera, shows Mr. Warren giving a guided tour of some of the more unique haunted artifacts resting in the Connecticut garage. Now the full video, definitely worth a watch if you're a big fan of the Warrens, since it's as close as you'll be able to get to walking around the museum these days. It's a full half hour long of old Ed going into grand detail and recounting some stories about some of their more notable and famous cases. Shoutouts include the witch Hannah Crana, an old Connecticut legend, or the conjuring mirror, which might sound like it has something to do with the movie, but very confusingly refers to a case where someone used this mirror in a ritual to try and summon a demon, a different demon. Ed talks briefly on some of their many, many, many cursed dolls and toys, such as a dinosaur from the Devil Made Me Do It case and film, and of course, no visit to the Worms Museum would exclude Annabelle, she's the star attraction of the place, probably what keeps the lights on for so long. 
She's shown under a tight lock and key, and Ed goes over the history of how they brought her in, and he touches briefly on the containment protocol for her. How she has to always be locked up in a storage box behind glass, surrounded by rosary beads and doused in holy water, in an effort to keep the vile spirits tucked away. A small question, if a spirit is so powerful and malevolent that it's got this unspeakable ancient evil that attacks humans, wouldn't it be stronger than a pane of glass? Wouldn't it be stronger than a thin little thing of glass? I, I guess it's a doll, but I didn't think the solution to ultimate evil was to just put like a fence around it. <laughs> That's what you do when like a dog is getting into stuff that you don't want them to get into. You just fence them out a bit in the backyard. Dogs, haunted dolls. Okay. <laughs> Number 3 The Shadow Doll And coming in at the number 3 spot for today is going to be this footage of the Shadow Doll. When you first enter the Warren's Haunted Museum, be it digitally or physically, one of the first things you'll see is this frightening little doll, affectionately dubbed the Shadow Doll. The Shadow Doll, that's fun to say. It's made of bird feathers and real human teeth. Lovely, those are some of my favorite ingredients. Now it's currently owned by Tony Sparrow. He offers a bit of insight into the doll's history, saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was sold with the owners of the shop completely oblivious to the doll's cursed energy. I don't buy that at all. What do you mean oblivious to the doll's cursed energy? Somebody came to you and sold you a doll made of bird feathers and human teeth and your first instinct wasn't to douse the thing in holy water and kerosene for good measure? I know pawn shops ain't exactly the classiest place around, but you gotta have some standards, right? You gotta be able to recognize evil. There are very few dolls with human teeth that aren't evil. Sparrow claims the doll has an insidious curse inside it. Oh, wait, no, sorry, the Warrens weren't in insidious. Anyway, the curse says that if you take a photograph of the doll, and when it develops, you write a curse that you'd like to inflict and then send it to your victim. The person who then opens the envelope and sees the photo of the doll will invite the curse into your home. The doll is also capable of some dream magic like Freddy Krueger and can even stop your heart while you're asleep if Mr. Warren is to be believed. And I know what you might be thinking. Did you just curse all of us by showing us this footage and pictures of the doll? No, no, of course not. I toss a salt circle around the camera before I film anything just to make sure no residual curses pass through the internet. I will say though, I have heard some pretty credible rumors that you're more susceptible to be cursed if you don't like, comment, and subscribe after watching a video. So I honestly would say on the safe side of things, you should do that. And on another side note, having done a lot of research on the pair of these two, I cannot stress how many haunted dolls and toys these people had. They had like the world's scariest Toys R Us in their backyard. Number 2 Scotland City Under the City now, the Warrens' investigations didn't just take them on cross-country road trips to the United States. The Warrens visited a ghost in almost every state they claim, and then some. The Warrens' quest saw them traveling all over the globe in an effort to uncover truth and combat evil wherever it was found. In this recently uncovered footage, we can see a unique perspective from Lorraine digging underground in the secret vaults beneath Edinburgh. Under the ground is a series of large cavernous vaults that were once used as a storage space for merchants, but when abandoned became home to Edinburgh's poorest who began to make it their dwellings. Probably a real nice space, you know, no daylight, musty air, thriving rodent population, but you know what? For the right price, I would probably go for it. It's probably better than most apartments in Toronto. Because of this, the vaults were the perfect place to conduct a little nefarious business that aren't quite fit to discuss on YouTube, but naughty stuff, just know that. It's believed that two of Edinburgh's most pro prolific criminals hid bodies here before taking them to medical schools to sell off. Having known this, with this context, it's absolutely no surprise that people believe the vaults to be haunted and claim that they feel watched or touched when walking through them. So if there's something weird going on, the Warrens follow. This one's actually pretty cool footage, I gotta admit. It's first person making you feel like you're exploring the subterranean depths with her. She's being guided by an old Scotsman who seems to know the tunnels pretty well, and I gotta say, if I ever take a tour of an underground vault, this is exactly who I would like to be taking me, and an old Scottish man, that's the most appropriate and trustworthy way to go ghost hunting. Now, they didn't find anything on this particular investigation, but while in there, Lorraine does claim that she can feel something communicating with her. Could it be spirits from long, long ago reaching out to Lorraine Warren who claimed she had an extrasensory gift? Or maybe it was just kind of cold down there. And number one, an exorcism. To some, the ultimate dream would be getting to ride up in the front seat with Warrens on one of their cases, getting to experience the paranormal firsthand under the tutelage of those who claim to have battled it their whole lives. It would be like if Obi-Wan Kenobi asked you if you want to go on an adventure with him. It'd be awesome. Well, hey. Some people, they get to live their dreams every day. 
Like me, my dream was to stand in front of a camera and endlessly talk about ghosts and goblins, and it really is just the best. But a YouTuber by the name of Haley Reese got to live her dream when she met Tony Sparrow, the husband of Judy Warren, the daughter of the family, and Lorraine Warren a bit before she passed away. She got blessed with a look into some never before seen footage of the pair of demonologists conducting field work, namely an exorcism. Now, the person in the video has been blurred out to protect their safety, as you know, it's one thing to be possessed by a demon, but doxing, whole other. We see Lorraine and Tony both fiercely conducting an exorcism, locked in spiritual warfare against a demonic force. We can hear Tony asking for the demon's name repeatedly, not because he's a friendly guy trying to make conversation, but because in order to properly drive a demon out of a host, you need to know its name. The name said Beelzebub. Now, there is a little bit of a discrepancy whether or not Beelzebub and the devil are considered different entities, really depending on what book and depending on who you ask. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Either way, it's very bad news to have inside of you. Worst part is apparently that wasn't even the only demon inside there. It was like a clown car of demons inside one guy. Not enough room. Luckily, the pair was able to get all of the demons outside of them and banish them away. Does anyone wonder, does it leave like a weird taste in your mouth after you've had demonic possession? I feel like there's an aftertaste, you know? I definitely feel like I would need to brush my teeth afterwards, I think. In fifth place, we have Ed's paintings. So long before they were famed ghost hunters investigating, you know, the Amityville horror and featured in films such as The Conjuring, Ed and Lorraine had a much different hobby. Painting. Actually, it was how the duo made a living. Ed Warren was a trained fine arts painter. The duo traveled all over the country to sell their paintings, and they also taught art classes. The couple used Ed's paintings as a way to gain entry into houses they wanted to investigate. They would research houses they believed to be haunted, and then drive to the house. After Ed painted the house in question, he would then hand the painting to Lorraine, who would go up, knock on the door, and offer the homeowners a painting, which would usually turn into a conversation about the property and the hauntings. This process was how their investigative career began. Ed became known for his barn door art, painting tranquil winter scenes on stained pine, which was all the range for adorning the wood grain halls of any home in the late 60s, and apparently these paintings are now quite rare. Many of his paintings that have been photographed feature different haunted houses, and examples of his art and calligraphy style are displayed throughout the museum. In fourth place, we have black magic masks. These fall under the practice of tulpa, which is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal of a materialized thought form, typically in human form, such as an imaginary friend or being that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In simpler English, the masks act as a representation of the practice, which is a form of mysticism that involves creating sentient and autonomous beings separate from oneself. So. An imaginary friend? The concept of tulpas and their creation, including the word tulpa, come from a close in Tibetan Buddhist practice, with tulpa being a Tibetan word for creature of the mind. Tulpas did not become part of Western paranormal lore until the 1970s, and those who practice have been cited as wearing masks similar to Halloween ones in order to take on the appearance of whatever the mask looks like. I guess that explains why I've seen many cheap looking Halloween masks in the video walkthroughs from the museum, so I suppose I'll retract my statements that I made about how pathetic they look. If anyone is curious about modern practices and appropriations of tulpamancers, the interweb origins can be traced back to 4chan message boards in 2009, and no, if you don't know what that means, I'm not going to elaborate on just how cursed that sentence was to utter. Oh, it gets worse. All right. The communities gained popularity when adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from the Friendship is Magic television series. The fans attempted to use meditation and lucid dreaming techniques to create imaginary friends. Look, I knew someone back in high school who fell under that subculture, and he was the furthest thing from mentally stable. The guy had to... Uh, people munching fantasies as well. Uh, time to move on before I get nightmares again. In third place, we have a satanic idol. So this story began in 1991 when a deer hunter was walking through the woods in Connecticut close to where Ed and Lorraine resided. The hunter got lost and after some time stumbled upon a raised circular rock formation with the idol in question standing in the middle of it. It is believed that the formation was common with folks who practiced devil worship in the 70s. The hunter began to feel uncomfortable and left the area, deciding to make his way back to his car, and along the way, he noticed an elderly gentleman walking alongside him, who was dressed head to toe in black. Now, the man in black never spoke a single word to the deer hunter. The hunter was getting more nervous by the second, and also more lost and unsure of his directional path. Desperate, he turned to the mysterious figure and simply asked, how do I get out of here? Luckily for our narrator, 
The man in black pointed in a direction and then disappeared. The hunter was so thrown off by that day that he reached out to Ed, who requested to be brought to the same area. The hunter wasn't 100% sure he could find the exact location, but was willing to try. Together, the men were able to stumble through the forest, and without the aid of the man in black this time, found the rock formation. Ed removed the demonic. A man in black spotting and weird forest stuff isn't weird enough for us. Approximately three days after removing the idol, Lorraine collapsed for no known reason, and she was transported to the hospital where no one could identify to the hospital where no one could identify are very popular numbers amongst the demonic scary people and things that you want to avoid. Ed believed that this was caused by the gentleman in black who was believed to have been a high priest in a satanic cult as a form of payback for removing the satanic idol. Now this idol remains in the Warrens Museum to this day and honestly I think it looks like a paper mache masterpiece of an alien but please let me know in the comments if anyone out there has a different opinion. Mm. In second place, we have a shadow doll. So among one of the first haunted items visible in the museum to visitors is a shadow doll, which boasts bird feathers and a genuine human tooth. Mm -mm. Unlike the other dolls included in the museum, I'd consider this creature more of a sculpture, ergo why she made her way to my list today. Also, she's just overall terrifying to look at. I'm calling it now. She better join the TV universe soon. So a shadow doll is a statue or deity of sorts that is made specifically for harm and to be used at the center of curses. I happen to know the steps for the most common curse, and while well, I'll leave out a step for safety, yes, I promise I'll elaborate. So the caster would first need to take a picture of the doll, write a curse on the back of the photo, and then send it to whomever the curse is aimed for. The person who receives the picture with the curse will sadly invite that curse into their lives. I'm thinking, oh, totally forgot. The doll will also appear in that person's dreams. While not too much is known about the origins of this specific doll, it was initially purchased in a vintage store under the assumption that it was, you know, simply an antique. I have a couple of antique dolls myself and I'm shuddering to think about what they would do if activated by any kind of curse. They've already got enough of a personality. Thanks. In our first place, we have a copy of Crying Boy. So when Bob Smith was a young child in the 70s, he became fascinated by a painting in his grandmother's house. The painting was a cheap print of a well-known piece and was hung on the living room wall. The photo depicted a boy who was a similar age to Bob and for some reason looked sad and downcast with tears brimming from his troubled eyes. A few years after the painting went up on the wall, there was a devastating kitchen fire in the house. While the kitchen was destroyed, the rest of the house was undamaged. The painting was eventually sold in a garage sale to Ed Warren himself. For years it puzzled Bob why his grandmother got rid of the painting until he read a series of articles about a cursed painting. Yep, that painting was The Crying Boy. That's the title of the painting. The Crying Boy was one in a series of paintings by artist Giovanni Bregolin that was completed in the 1950s. The series depicted young, teary-eyed younglings. While it may seem strange to want an image of a weeping child on your wall, the pictures proved popular all over the world. For example, in the UK alone, over 50,000 copies were sold. The children represented were often poor and very beautiful. In total, Giovanni painted over 60 paintings, and up until the early 80s, prints and reprints of his images continued to be mass-produced. In 1985, the most popular tabloid newspaper in the United Kingdom printed a story that caused panic and ended the popularity of his work. The Sun published an article entitled Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy, describing the terrible experience of May and Ron Hall after their home was destroyed by fire. The cause of the fire, much like Bob's grandmother's, was a greasy pan that overheated and burst into flames. The fire spread rapidly and destroyed everything on the ground floor of the home. Only one item remained intact, print of the crying boy on their living room wall. Distraught at their loss, the devastated couple made the bizarre claim that the painting was cursed and it, not the pan, was the cause of the fire. Now, this tale probably would have disappeared into the archives of strange and mysterious stories, except for one, um, tiny thing. A firefighter claimed that he had attended at least 15 house fires where everything was destroyed except for Prince of the Crying Boy, which would remain completely intact. So before long, this gathered momentum, and a rash of fires all over the world were blamed on the cursed child, not to be confused with the play that's currently running of the same name. In subsequent articles, the Sun went on to claim that a woman had lost her house to a fire six months after buying the painting, two sisters had fires in their homes after buying a copy of the painting, when one sister even claimed to have seen her painting sway backwards and forwards on the wall while it was happening, a concerned woman on the Isle of Wight attempted to burn her painting without success and then went on to suffer a run of very bad luck, a gentleman in Nottingham who possessed a print of the painting lost his home and his family was injured, a pizza parlor got destroyed, including every painting on their walls except for 
the crying boy, when the son reported that even rational firefighters refused to have a copy of this painting in their homes, the reputation of the crying boy was damned forever. In all these cases, and many more that were reported, paintings of the crying boy went unharmed. Eventually, if there was an image of a crying child by any artist in a house that went on fire. Now, some folks claimed that they experienced bad luck if they attempted to destroy or even get rid of the paintings, while others were convinced that it was only a matter of time before disaster struck them. The Sun eventually offered the frightened public a solution. On Halloween night of 1985, hundreds of the paintings were collected together by the newspaper and burnt under the supervision of the fire brigade. So why would this seemingly innocent series of paintings be cursed? Theories ranged from the little boy being from a Romani family who placed a curse on the artist, to others claiming that the subject of the painting had died in a fire and his spirit was trapped in the art. The most enduring story claims that the boy accidentally set fire to the studio of Giovanni Bregolin. Simply put, wherever the little orphan went, fires mysteriously followed earning him the name Diablo or Devil. And that brings us to the end of our time for today. Seriously. Number 5. The White Lady Ghost Among the Warrens' storied career of demonology was a peculiar case involving a local Connecticut legend, the White Lady Ghost of Union Cemetery. Whoosh, that, that's a doozy of a title. Can you just shorten that down just like a Union Cemetery Ghost? There you go. Three words. Anyway. Union Cemetery dates back 400 years, and it's said to have been haunted by this one notable ghost in particular. Now, exactly where she came from, nobody's quite sure, you know? Nobody's got an exact date and time. Some speculate that she's a woman who lost a child in childbirth and hasn't been able to move on to the afterlife and still seeks out her child. Others speculate that she's a ghost of a victim who was dumped into a sinkhole near the cemetery and is unable to move on while the crime goes unpunished. The fact that we don't even know her name, I'm sure that's probably bothering her somewhat too. The only things anyone can agree on is that those who say they've seen her claim that she's dressed in a bright white nightgown and has her head and face concealed with a white bonnet. A particularly good ghost story says that in the late 90s, a firefighter responding to a call nearby to the cemetery said that a woman in a white dress jumped in front of the truck and landed behind him. When he leapt out of the vehicle, there was no body on the ground but a dent in the hood. So naturally, such a popular ghost would have to catch the attention of Connecticut locals Ed and Lorraine Warren, and this rare footage is Ed filming the cemetery looking for proof of the white lady. We'll play some of it for you now, and you can try and make out what's happening. It won't be the easiest. Ed Warren claims you can see the ghost walking behind in the shadows and turning to look at him. Now, Ed Warren said that this evidence was so important it had to be locked away to be studied by the New England Society of Paranormal Research, but not to burst anyone's bubbles. It kind of looks to me like they locked it away because it's not really that impressive. You let me know if you could see what they were trying to get me to see, because personally I just see some blurry lights in a dark graveyard. But maybe I'm not opening my third eye enough. If you're looking for more ghost videos, stories of the Warrens, hauntings, possessions, exorcisms, and a whole lot more, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click through, please subscribe, please ring that little bell so you don't miss a single one of our videos. But do that at the end of this video, okay? Because I got four more Ed and Lorraine Warren stories coming up for you right now. Number 4. Ed Warren Invoking a Spirit on Camera Coming up next is this video uploaded by Tony Sparrow, the Warrens' son-in-law, on his personal YouTube channel. If you're a fan of the Warrens and you're not already, I would recommend subscribing to Tony Sparrow. He puts all sorts of Warren related clips up on the channel and it's fun. Now it's hard to say much about this particular video because it was uploaded without a whole lot of context. The video doesn't really mention a date, a location, or a case, or anything else like that. It's a bit troublesome because the Warrens have said to have worked on hundreds of hundreds of cases over the years. So this could be any one of them, or maybe it's just one of the lesser, you know, less exciting cases that got pushed to the side. They can't all get made into movies, you know. Now in the video, we can see Ed filming what looks like a fairly normal 70s living room, although the room is definitely haunted. You can tell right away from that liminal yellow wallpaper. Color. You can hear Ed Warren yelling out the name of Jesus Christ in an attempt to provoke the spirit into appearing. It's said that during an exorcism to get a spirit or a demon or a ghost to reveal itself, you need to invoke the name of Jesus Christ, put a little fear of God into him. After about a minute of some serious invoking, it seems like Ed is finally getting through to the spirit because we see the table and chairs slide across the ground as if they're being pushed backwards by some incredible invisible force. Now, 
We don't really see anything more exciting or spiritual than the chairs and tables getting pushed, but that's pretty exciting nonetheless. There's not a ton of footage from the Warrens while they were, you know, working the field, so it's pretty exciting to see whenever we get opportunities like this, though. Of course, I do hear you saying this could just be faked. So is this the footage of a ghost caught on camera, or is this nothing more than a faked video to drum up some attention back in the day, like an original CGI hoax video on TikTok? Number three, driveway alien. Ed and Lorraine Warren got involved in all sorts of things. It's said that they've tussled with vampires, with werewolves. Now we don't have it on 100% authority that they ever encountered aliens, but they definitely could have. They researched everything. So let's take a look at this weird video of what looks to be a visitor from another world touching down on the driveway. You wouldn't expect aliens to make first contact in Colorado, but hey, here we are. In this video, we can see a really scrawny little creature walking up and down Vivian Gomez's driveway. The creature had people talking because, well, take a look at it. Just what is it? It almost looks like it's got giant ears flopping around when it moves, and I'm not gonna lie to you, it reminds me a lot of Dobby from Harry Potter, so maybe he just got a sock and he's just celebrating his happiness and he's excited to be free. The woman whose driveway caught the security footage, one Vivian Gomez, had this to offer when she posted it on Facebook. So I woke up on Sunday Monday morning and saw this on my camera and I'm trying to figure out what the heck. First I saw the shadow walking from my front door, then I saw this thing. Has anyone else seen this on their cameras? The other two cameras didn't pick it up for some reason. Sadly, her security camera only films for about 10 seconds or so, so this is the only footage that she was able to capture of this mysterious driveway creature. Gomez clarified for everyone that whatever it was wasn't her son. Okay, we weren't thinking that, but now we're definitely not thinking that. Because she doesn't let him out by himself that late, although... There, I, that opens up a lot of questions. <laughs> she saw something strange running around her driveway at night and considered the possibility that that might be her son. Like I said, I'm pretty sure the most likely possibility is that this is a freed house elf excited for the future or a very confused alien. Could be an alien that just touched down. Maybe a Terminator traveling through time. That's why it looked naked. Gang. You let me know, you let me know what you think what this mystery monster could have been down below. Number two, Jarkin. Coming up next is a clip out of India that went viral last year and captured the attention of paranormal enthusiasts, alien hunters, and skeptics alike. I like when you can get everybody all in together and like that. You see something weird on camera, we're like, is this an alien? Is this a ghost? Is this a demon? I'm not sure, but let's all take a look at it. A strange humanoid-like figure was spotted walking across the road in India confusing everybody. Whatever it was, it was filmed walking alone steadily on a bridge at night in Jharkhand in eastern India, staggering around through the night. Now the thing looks human, and my brain initially is like, yeah, that's a human. But the more you look at it, the more you start to wonder if maybe, just maybe, this might have crawled out of something. This creature is gangly, and it has these long arms and long, pale, white skin, and very skinny, and it looks like something out of Silent Hill. Motorcyclists were swerving out of the way of this figure, which stops and stares at them for a bit before continuing to stroll onwards. Now naturally, this got people talking, because it's not every day you see a terrifying, pale figure like that. More than a few people suggested that it could be an alien walking around the streets at night explaining why it seems so confused. Others suggested that it could be a ghost which would be pretty spooky. I would say it does seem like it's physically present. It seems like it's physically on the road. So I'm not 100% that it's a ghost. And finally there's the realists who have suggested that this could just be someone who had a long, long night and is lost and, and on all the substances right now just trying to get a good night's sleep. As far as I know, no one has cracked this case. Certainly not Ed and Lorraine Warren. So we may never have a satisfying answer. And number one, the Buddhist exorcism. It wasn't just the United States where Ed and Lorraine Warren worked on their cases. If there was a call for it, the Warrens would do their best to answer. Plus, I don't know, I feel like if you only hunt ghosts in one country, then you're missing out on just so many good demons and ghosts out there. If you're a fan of the channel, and I hope you are, then you know by now just how many amazing, interesting, regional monsters, myths, and cryptids there are all over the world. You you can spend your whole life battling demons, but have you ever gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with an oni or a yokai, something like that? 
Well maybe that's why the Warrens decided to take a trip out to Japan in the early 2000s. Maybe they wanted a vacation and a change of pace or maybe they were looking to challenge themselves. They set out to Japan to investigate these allegedly haunted tunnels where a number of people were reported to have died in. Ed was a World War II Navy veteran and had spent a lot of time around Japan and was fascinated in their culture and the things that he had seen while stationed there. Of course. Hardly a vacation because while they were there they were asked to participate in a Buddhist exorcism of a young woman named Teresa who would become the unwilling host to a litany of demons. They were aided by a group of Buddhists during the exorcism which is probably a change of pace from their usual ordained Catholic ministers. In the clip we can hear Lorraine doing her level best to try and cast the evil out of the young girl's body. The clip is a bit hard to watch and that's coming from someone who watches ghost videos literally every single day of his life. You're watching someone writhe around screaming and what looks like agony. But hey, luckily they were being tended to by the experts. Ed and Lorraine Warren spoke very highly of the Buddhist monks helping them as well saying they were cut from a different cloth. I'm not sure if that's a pun or not. I feel too if they ever start running out of ideas for the Conjuring movies they should definitely start sending the Warrens international. Conjuring in Japan I already feel like that's a good premise for a movie. Or maybe and bear with me here the Conjuring movies should get way more wild. We already know they're only based on true stories they're not real stories so just have have them fighting God Godzilla or whatever. I would love to see Ed and Lorraine Warren try and exercise Godzilla. You let me know who you'd love to see Ed and Lorraine go toe to toe against. I'd want to see what they could do with Freddy Krueger too personally. Upon entering the Warren's museum one of the first things you'll see is this frightening little shadow doll made of bird feathers and real human teeth. The Warren's son-in-law and current proprietor of the museum Tony Sparrow offers a bit of insight on the doll saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was being sold and the owners of the shop being none the wiser of the dolls evil had it for sale. That's totally on the antique shop owners though. You come into possession of a doll made of bird feathers and human teeth your first instinct should be to bury it with some rosaries not stick a price tag on it but I digress. The doll's curse works by taking a photograph of the doll and when it develops writing the curse you'd like to inflict and sending it to your victim. The person who then opens the envelope and sees the doll in the photograph will invite the curse into your home. The real question I have about the shadow doll is do you think it is jealous that it's not the most famous haunted doll in the Warrens collection? I know I'd probably have a hard time sitting next to Annabelle all day while everyone comes to gawk at my movie star sister. And no wonder the doll is cursing people. If you're having fun drop a subscribe and catch new scary videos every single day. Number 4 The Brick from Borley Rectory A brick? Ok you're running out of ideas and it's only number 4. Well bear with me ok. It's not just the brick it's the story behind the brick. And besides a, a brick is actually pretty scary on its own doesn't even need to be haunted. Just imagine it being thrown thrown into a window bam very scary. Anyway this particular cursed brick comes to us from Borley Rectory. One of the most haunted houses in the United Kingdom and I gotta say possibly one of the worst named buildings in the country. Borley Rectory sounds like a horrible medical infection. Borley Rectory could be its own video based on all the alleged hauntings and stories that have taken place in its hallowed walls. Since the 18th century it's been home to all sorts of reported hauntings. It checks off all the usual requirements for a haunted domicile. To name a few, unexplained footsteps, ghostly apparitions, bells ringing without reason, whispers of a headless monk that would wander the halls, horse drawn carriages being commandeered by a headless horseman, seeing shadows, and one ghastly nun who just may be served as the inspiration for the nun from the film The Nun. There is a lot going on at this haunted building. So naturally it's a great spot for two famed demonologists and sometime in the 1970s Ed and Lorraine Warren ventured out to the UK to investigate the Borley Rectory and see if maybe they could put a plug in some of this. Upon entering Lorraine declared almost immediately that she could feel the presence of a nun's spirit. So the pair took some photographs and after developing the photographs lo and behold was the ghostly apparition of a nun in the corner. Now obviously the story of the film is much different and in the film The Nun the Warrens only really appear for a Thanos style cameo at the end but you never know this could very well have been the inspiration for that character. The brick serves as a souvenir and a remainder of one more haunting in their story logbook. Number 3 The Satanic Idol and the Human Skull No way. No way a satanic idol and a human skull are haunted. No way. The skull was given to the Warrens, a 
apparently as a gift, and I sincerely hope they kept the gift receipts for that one, because it's not the kind of thing I'd like, but they probably loved it. Now, the satanic idol is a slightly different story. The tall, slender, bizarre idol doesn't immediately scream Satan or satanic, but all you need to do is take a single look at it to be unnerved. It's definitely not the kind of thing you'd ever want to be face to face with, or I don't know, see in a scary clearing in the woods. And yet for one lonesome hunter, that's exactly what happened. Apparently, the idol and the skull with it were taken from the woods nearby the Warren estate by a local hunter who had found them both. The hunter claims that he was approached by a man in mysterious black garb who ushered him away. Obviously, a little shaken and stirred by such a bizarre experience, went to the only people he thought he could trust with something like this, and he took the idol to the Warrens for safekeeping. Now, after he brought it to them, Lorraine Warren fell deeply ill almost immediately after bringing the idol into their home with no one able to correctly diagnose what was happening to her. Ed believed that his family was being targeted for welcoming the idol into their home. You'd think that a pair of story demonologists like this would have seen this coming, but you know, we all make mistakes. Lorraine recovered, obviously, and although no details emerged on how she did or, or what they did to purify and cleanse the idol, we can assume most likely it was probably blessed, exercised, and doused in holy water of some kind, Otherwise, it wouldn't be fit to sit amongst their treasures. It now rests inside the museum, alongside all their other haunted relics, patiently waiting for Hollywood, where I've heard it's very open to hearing offers for a three-picture deal and some spin-offs if that's on the table. Number two, the organ. Now, one of the more mysterious items inside the museum is this big grand organ. Get your mind out of the gutter. It's a musical instrument, like a church organ. The church organ was recovered after authorities seized a haunted house in Connecticut. Having close ties to the Warrens, the authorities asked if there was anything they might like to retrieve from the site. The house burned down mysteriously, not even days after the organ was removed. Ed Warren, lover of all things haunted and a good bargain, had a great interest in this organ, and keeping of his self-imposed duty of controlling haunted objects, took it upon himself to take it home. And obviously this thing was cursed, obviously. Ed Warren would say that he would hear songs being played from it discordantly throughout his home whenever no one was around. And when Ed would venture forth into his office to investigate it, the music would stop as soon as he opened the door. He says this would occur every time he tried to investigate it, happening three different times. Eventually, losing sleep over one more haunted relic, Ed Warren contacted a friend at the clergy to come bless it. He would have a priest come by every two weeks or so to bless his home and to bless every item in the museum to keep the spirits docile. It begs the question, with this much effort, why even keep cursed items in your home? The organ at least seems benevolent, but Annabelle, the skulls, the satanic idols, why them? Well, Ed and Lorraine believed by keeping these items under supervision, it meant they were safe from outside interference and no one else would be put at risk. The pair feared that if any of the cursed objects were destroyed or damaged, then they could release the spirits back into the world, free to cause more mayhem. The same reason is why, despite the passing of the Warrens, the museum is still kept up and open and maintained. And also so, you know, paranormal ghouls and goblins like us can go check out all the spooky stuff and get some fantastic Instagram stories out of it. Number one, The Conjuring Mirror. Hey, wait a second, there wasn't a particularly notable mirror in The Conjuring, are you trying to fool me? It was a haunted music box. Well, you're totally right, it was, it was a haunted music box. This is a different thing unrelated to The Conjuring, but related to The Conjuring in the sense that it was owned by Ed and Lorraine. Give it enough time, this might be in one of the movies. Over the years, you've probably heard all sorts of superstitions regarding mirrors. I mean, I'm sure you've heard that breaking one is seven years of bad luck. But there are some who say that mirrors can be used as portals to other worlds, and can be used as the stage for all manner of ritual. It's even been said this is how Nostradamus was able to peer so deep into the future. This desire caught the attention of one Stephen Zellner, a Connecticut native who wanted to try a little soothsaying of his own. He acquired the mirror and performed a ritual on the art of claptromancy, dangling the mirror from a thread into a pool of water, where supposedly, if performed correctly, you'll be able to see visions in the reflections below. Well, as the story goes, for Zellner, it worked and he saw brief glimpses of his future, but didn't see the spirits that had been kept inside the mirror which he invited into his home, wreaking all manner of havoc on him. Doors would slam shut, drawers would fly open, objects would be hurled across the room, the poltergeist classics. Knowing that he'd invited something dark that he couldn't handle into his home, he reached out to the church for an exorcism and was referred to Ed and Lorraine. The pair exorcised the spirits 
back into the mirror, sealing them back. Knowing that it wasn't safe to leave the mirror in the hands of Zellner, the two offered to take it off of his hands, protecting and controlling the evil inside and adding it to their collection of delightful cursed relics where it now resides. In fifth place, we have a satanic idol. This story began in 1991 when a deer hunter was walking through the woods in Connecticut, close to where Ed and Lorraine resided. The hunter got lost and after some time stumbled upon a raised circular rock formation with the idol in question standing in the middle of it. It is believed that the formation was common with folks who practiced devil worship in the 70s. The hunter began to feel uncomfortable and left the area, deciding to make his way back to his car and along the way he noticed an elderly gentleman walking along alongside him who was dressed in head to toe black. The man in black never spoke a single word to the deer hunter. Now the hunter was getting more nervous by the second and also more lost and unsure of his directional path. Desperate, he turned to the mysterious figure and simply asked, how do I get out of here? Luckily for our narrator, the man in black pointed in a direction and then disappeared. The hunter was so thrown off by that day that he reached out to Ed who requested to be brought to the same area. Now the hunter wasn't 100% sure he could find the exact location but was willing to try. Together, the two men were able to stumble through the forest and without the aid of the man in black this time found the rock from. Ed removed the demonic idol from the area and placed it in the museum and that's when things got a little weirder. Approximately three days after removing the idol, Lorraine collapsed for no known reason and she was transported to the hospital where no one could identify what was wrong with her. Thankfully, after three more days, she recovered. Now Ed believed that this was caused by the gentleman in black who was believed to have been a high priest in a satanic cult as a form of payback for removing the satanic idol. In fourth place, we have a conjuring book. So one night after returning home from a night out with Ed, Lorraine was reviewing the calls left on the answering machine when she found one from a distraught woman who introduced herself as a Mrs. Sandy Foster who nervously described a very distressing situation and begged the Warrens to return her call. So even though it was like 1240 in the morning, Lorraine immediately tried to call her back and while the phone rang continuously, the connection was broken. Lorraine tried a few more times, going so far as to contact the phone operator and the operator's supervisor, who ran tests on the phone line and frustratingly didn't find anything weird. The next day, when the Warrens returned home from church, Lorraine immediately phoned the foster home again. This time, Mrs. Foster answered the phone on the second ring and mentioned that the phone had never rang the night before, and Lorraine made the decision to go pay the Fosters a visit that afternoon. She and Ed arrived at around 2 p.m. and met not only Mrs. Foster and her husband, but also their three offspring, Abby, Joel, and Hannah, who had experienced most of the phenomena. Ed arranged his recording gear on a nearby table while Lorraine asked her permission to walk the house, which she was immediately granted. Mrs. Foster brought up that her daughter Meg, the three offspring, Abby, Joel, and Meg, who had experienced most of the phenomena. Ed arranged his recording gear on a nearby table while Lorraine asked her permission to walk the house, which she was immediately granted. Mrs. Foster brought up that her daughter Meg had always been interested in the occult and had purchased a book on conjuring as a gift for Meg. And based off of the description Ed gave of it, I believe it was a copy of the Ars Goetia. Now Meg admitted to attempting to summon a few of the spirits in the book, but had lost hope because nothing had happened. Ed prompted further, asking for specifics on the experiences that had happened in the last week when only the younglings were home. So let's set the scene. The boys were already in bed and Meg had just taken a shower. After going downstairs to make sure the doors were locked and you know the lights were off, Meg returned upstairs to the sounds of running water and the faucets had turned back on without any human's touch. Now downstairs, the lights and the radio had turned back on as well. Meg went downstairs and watched the radio dial moving on its own. After turning it off again, she got halfway up the stairs when she felt an icy cold hand touch her on the shoulder, just for a second in the dark. Now Meg bolted up the rest of the stairs, into her room, shut the door, turned off the lights, and hid under her covers. Outside the door, sounds of heavy footsteps caused her to suddenly shake under her covers. And then, more noises joined in with the mysterious steps. A door downstairs slammed shut, accompanied by furniture being pushed around and crashing, almost as if an angry person had broken into remodel. When Meg was able to open her eyes again, she saw a silver light come out of the woods and glide into her room. The next thing she knew, something, some hand, yanked her hair three times. Each time it pulled harder until the third time it made her eyes water. Now she ran into her brother's room for safety and he confirmed that he was also terrified by hearing the assorted unknown noises. Accompanied by loud whispering he could not make out. The duo eventually gathered enough courage to call their parents at the home they were at, but by the time the adults returned, all of the paranormal action had paused and they were convinced the offspring were um, making it up. On the second occasion, everything that happened was almost the same as the first, but this time they involved the family dog who was snarling at something that no one could see. Now Joel remembered it as strange because the dog was deaf and could barely hear noise. So when the wards were hiding in a bedroom on this occasion, instead of a silver figure, they saw a dark purplish cloud that they were unable to look at directly. So Lorraine at this point had returned and reported that she had experienced an inhuman presence throughout the home and asked Meg if she possessed, you know, black conjuring candles in her room. And when she responded yes, Ed told the family that he and Lorraine could handle everything, but um, they should maybe head out for a drive while it was happening. For safety. Ed and Lorraine got to work the moment the Fosters left, determined to discover the true nature of the spirit's presence in order to dispel it. For provocation purposes, Ed used 
used a crucifix and holy water, scattering the water at all four points of the cellar floor, and saying aloud, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command all spirits, whether human or diabolical, to leave this dwelling and never return. On the first floor, Ed repeated the same procedure in each of the rooms. This process, known to any exorcist as binding, requires the infesting spirit to either show itself or move on. Having bound the cellar and all downstairs room without incident, the Warrens were ready to approach the second floor, where they knew difficulty was lurking. But as they prepared to act, a telepathically projected feeling of dread came over them, which is a distinct indication of an inhuman demonic presence. They pressed on and began climbing the staircase to the second floor. But as hard as they tried, neither Ed nor Lorraine could get any more than halfway up, pushing against them with some impenetrable, unyielding force. So slowly, the Warrens backed down the stairs so as not to be knocked over backwards. And at the bottom of the stairs, for a brief second, and diabolical laughter rang out. So, annoyed, Ed threw more holy water on the stairs, which caused the pressure to diminish enough to let them reach the top. They were able to bind almost all the rooms without incident, saving Meg's for last. Ed swung the door wide open, and he and Lorraine immediately felt the need to take a step back from the horrible sense of misery emanating from the room. With a steely composure, Ed walked into the room, cross in hand. Though no physical presence was there to be seen, the bedroom was freezing cold. One last time, Ed threw holy water in all four corners of the room, commanding, give us some sign of departure or an exorcism will be conducted here this very day. Almost instantly, the morbid sense of misery began to drain away, and the temperature in the room gradually returned to normal. So Meg's bedroom did contain those black conjuring candles, occult vestments, and books containing the rites for rituals of all sorts. Ed placed the items in the gal's trash basket, set them out in the hallway, and then sealed the room by reading a prescribed prayer of sanctification. He brought them back to his home for safekeeping, and uh, that's one copy of the Ars Goetia I have no need to read. Thank you! See? I've told y'all, don't summon beings! In third place, we have a shadow doll. Among one of the first haunted items visible to those who visit the Warren Occult Museum is a shadow doll, which boasts bird feathers and a genuine human tooth, and she's just overall terrifying to look at. I'm calling it now, she better join that TV universe one day. For reference, a shadow doll is a statue or deity of sorts that is made specifically for harm to be used at the center of curses. I happen to know the steps for the most common curse, and while I'll leave out a step for safety, I promise, Collaborate. Now, the caster would first need to take a picture of the doll, write a curse on the back of the photo, and uh, then send it to whoever the curse is aimed for. You know, hopefully you've got their mailing address. The person who receives the picture with the curse will sadly invite that curse into their lives. Oh, I uh, almost forgot. The doll is also going to appear in that person's dreams, so enjoy your nightmares, folks. While not too much is known about the origins of this specific doll, it was initially purchased in a secondhand store under the assumption that it was simply, you know, an antique. I've got a couple of old dolls myself, and I'm shuddering to think about what they would do if activated by any kind of curse. Some of them talk enough already. In second place, we have Black Magic Mask, which is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal, of a materialized thought form, typically in human form, such as an imaginary friend or being that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In simpler English, the masks act as a representation of the practice, which is a form of mysticism that involves creating sentient and autonomous beings separate from oneself. The concept of tulpas and their creation, including the word tulpa, come from a closed Tibetan Buddhist practice, with tulpa being a Tibetan word for a creature of the mind. Tulpas did not become part of Western paranormal lore until around the 1970s, and those who practice have been cited as wearing masks similar to Halloween ones in order to take on the appearance of whatever the mask looks like. If anyone is curious about modern practices and appropriations of tulpamancers, the interweb origins can be traced back to 4chan message boards in 2009, and I'm not going to elaborate on just how awful that sentence was to utter. Oh, it gets worse. The communities gained popularity when adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from the Friendship is Magic television series. The fans attempted to use meditation and lucid dreaming techniques to create imaginary friends. Well, I think that about sums that up, don't you? In first place, we have the Black Lace Veil. So after one of their many public lectures, Ed was conversing with a couple that had been in the audience, where the boy introduced himself as Alan and explained that he'd brought his girlfriend Lonnie to the lecture because he suspected that she'd been overtaken by some occult influence. He explained that when his girlfriend became angry, her features would change into something resembling a wolf, and then the voice of a different person would speak from inside her. When Lorraine walked over to join the group, Lonnie experienced an episode of instantaneous possession and lurched out in an attempt to attack Lorraine. This incident terrified everyone in the vicinity, with the Warrens ending the audience chat session immediately, before Ed escorted the couple to an offstage room while Lorraine stayed outside. In the backstage room, the girl was fully under possession, breathing heavily, and her facial features had transformed into the wolf-like appearance the boy had talked about. After about 10 minutes, the possession passed, and Lonnie was 
lucid enough to explain, you know, dealing with memory loss, along with losing hours and days of her life over the last three months, which is a symptom common in possession. She went on to share that originally her now boyfriend, Alan, had refused all of her advances and bribery attempts at becoming hers, and she had resorted to visiting a store prominent and selling tools to help with witchcraft, purchasing there a book on the black arts, and later that night performing a ritual for acquiring lovers. This ritual involved, you guessed it, the black lace veil, on top of which she placed a crown of goat horns before renouncing God and her baptism, along with swearing allegiance to Satan, finishing the ritual by washing down the vow with a cup of animal scarlet elixir. About a month after Lonnie performed the ritual, Alan began paying her the attention she craved, making her entitled world perfect. What she hadn't counted on, however, was that she was now in debt to the demonic, having given them permission to enter her life. Ed knew immediately that Lonnie would have to undergo an exorcism as soon as possible, and made contact with the priest the next morning, who was able to come assist with the procedure. Upon arrival, the priest insisted on testing the spirit, so he instructed Lonnie to close her eyes and slowly count to 20, while his assistant stood behind her and placed a cross around 6 inches behind her head. The entity possessing the girl suddenly went wild, screaming, take it away, it burns. Take it away. During the exorcism, it kept screaming, she's mine, she's mine, her soul is mine, in reference to Lonnie. It was eventually separated from Lonnie, but just before it departed, the thing vowed it would return to another. The Warrens brought the black lace veil, goat horns, cup, and the conjuring book home with them so she would be safe from repossession, but the tale of the veil doesn't end here. Months later, when Ed was in a meeting with a lady who was manifesting different personalities, you know, some male, some female, and some that couldn't even be called human, but all making extremely threatening statements, her eyes began to wander, and when they landed on the black veil, she jumped up, grabbed the veil, and clutched it to her chest. Her features immediately began to transform into those of a wild wild, sneering creature, distinct from the otherwise attractive girl. Ed drew two vials of water to himself, one unblessed, the other blessed by an exorcist, and moved away from what was no longer this woman, but an inhuman spirit, a lesser devil of hell. Horn moaning and various animal sounds came from the girl as Ed blessed her, banishing the demon away for now a second and final time. And that brings us to the end of our list, and I'm glad all of those items are still kicking around the Warren Museum for safety and uh, not out in the open. I didn't think anything could scare me worse than Annabelle, my beloved, but I proved myself wrong today, for sure. <laughs> Let me know in the comments which item you found the scariest. And hey, while you're there, feel free to maybe, you know, leave us a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos. And I'll see y'all next time, you lovely spooky people.